My name is Doug Horn, and I work for the Assassination Records Review Board from August of 1995 through September of 1998. I was hired in 1995 as a senior analyst on the military records team and was promoted halfway through my three-year tour to become the chief analyst for military records. More than one decade after the review board shut down, I published my five-volume book, Inside the Assassination Records Review Board, in November of 2009. In this book, I present my conclusions about the medical cover-up surrounding the JFK assassination, about the alteration of the Zapruder film, and about the reasons why President Kennedy was killed. I want to thank the Future of Freedom Foundation for allowing me to present the basic conclusions of my book in this presentation. The name of my presentation is Altered History. Exposing Deceit and Deception in the JFK Assassination Medical Evidence. My next topic of discussion is the cranial x-rays of President Kennedy that exist today. The, there are only three extant skull x-rays. We know that five or six were taken. There are only three that exist today. And I mentioned earlier that all three of those are copy films. They're not originals. They're forged composite copy films. They're altered images. So let's examine what happened to the skull x-rays, why, and how it happened. Two of the three skull x-rays were altered following the autopsy to remove evidence of exit at the rear of President Kennedy's skull. Now, two of the x-rays total, two or three, were destroyed. They're not on the record today. On some occasions, Gerald Custer, the x-ray technician, said that five x-rays were taken. On some occasions, he said six. Dr. Ebersol, a radiologist, told Dr. David Mantic in an interview that there were six skull x-rays exposed. This means that either two or three skull x-rays were destroyed. A minimum of two were destroyed. Dr. David Mantic, a radiation oncologist, an MD, and a PhD in physics, as I mentioned earlier, has visited the National Archives a total of nine times to study primarily the JFK skull x-rays as well as the autopsy photographs. His conclusions after his nine visits are that the surviving three skull x-rays are composite copy films, forgeries, not originals. The two lateral skull x-rays, the side views, show an impossibly dense white patch in the right rear of the skull, obscuring the exit wound seen in both Dallas and at Bethesda Naval Hospital. The one AP x-ray, which is the anterior posterior view, the x-ray beam went from the front of the skull to the rear of the skull. The AP x-ray has had an apparent bullet fragment, conveniently matching the accused assassin's weapon superimposed on the image. Let me explain what I mean. This is an image of the right lateral skull x-ray. Uh, this is an enhanced image of the x-ray made by the HSCA staff. The reason they felt it was necessary to make an enhanced image in the first place is because the, the JFK skull x-rays are very unusual in appearance. They show a very high degree of contrast that is not normally seen in a skull x-ray. So they had to make an enhanced image to better study it. And uh, instead of a blowout in the right rear of the skull, which would be evidence of missing bone behind the right ear and missing brain tissue, uh, you see a very bright or lucent area. You can see it in this image. Now, now in an x-ray, light areas indicate that the x-rays pass through very dense material and couldn't quite all make it through the material. And dark areas indicates that the x-rays pass through very thin material or areas where there was just air, and that's why they're dark. Dr. Mantic used the science of optical densitometry to study the skull x-rays in the National Archives. Basically what he did was to use a device called a densitometer and study the amount of light coming through each skull x-ray at hundreds of different locations. This is a technique used in radiation oncology which he adapted to the study of the JFK skull x-rays. And his empirical data that he gathered over his nine visits 
revealed that this white patch in the rear of the skull behind the ear transmits about 1,100 times more light than the frontal region of the skull x-ray. So area F in this image is the frontal region of the right lateral skull x-ray. And the reason that it's very dark is because uh, there was a lot of brain tissue missing in this area and, and there was a lot of air in the skull at that point. That's why it's very dark. There's not a lot of tissue for the x-ray to pass through. The very dense region, the very lucent or bright region on the x-ray, which is labeled P, P for patch or P for posterior here, uh, normally that, on a, on a normal skull x-ray, the brightest area on the skull should only admit two or three times as much light as on the darkest area on the picture. And once again, let me explain that. In a normal skull x-ray, area P should only, exhibit, should only admit, in a normal skull x-ray, first of all, you wouldn't see this high degree of contrast. It's just very unusual, it's very abnormal. And second, in a normal skull x-ray, area P, the brightest area, would only admit two to three times more light than the darkest part of that skull x-ray, which is area F in this picture. But in the JFK lateral skull x-rays, area P admits 1,100 times more light than the frontal region. Dr. Mantic has concluded that area P was created by light blasting that region when the lateral x-rays were copied. This alteration of the lateral x-rays was performed to hide the blowout in the right rear of the skull. So let me explain in layman's terms what was involved in making these altered copy films of the JFK skull x-rays. Once the authentic x-ray was developed, you had a large sheet of film with an image on it. All one had to do in those days was to uh, go into a dark room, place a sheet of copy film underneath the developed x-ray. So you have an x-ray that's already developed, place a sheet of copy film underneath it of the same size, and then turn on the room lights for 10 to 20 seconds. So no x-rays were involved in making copy films in those days. You just turned on the ambient lights in the room. Then you turned the light off again and you would put a mask or a template on top of the developed x-ray, leaving a hole for the area that you wanted to light blast. In this case, in this case the area to be light blasted was the right rear of the skull where there was a large hole seen in Dallas. So a template was placed over the top of the authentic x-ray and then that area was light blasted. And then the copy x-ray was developed and the original x-ray was either destroyed or suppressed. So uh, Dr. Mantic in a series of control experiments has replicated this technique. He's done it himself and uh, this was relatively easy to do. The third skull x-ray is the AP, and you'll see that uh, in, in what appears to be the, to the viewer, it appears to be in the orbit of the right eye, you see a large, bright object, okay? Now this is an AP x-ray. The x-ray beam went from the front of the head toward the back, and that bright object is supposed to be a bullet fragment that was shaved off and remained on the back of the head, okay? So one can see this, bullet fragment on the lateral x-rays from the side, but it's very, very small and very, very thin, very minuscule. On this AP x-ray, the object is very, very bright and very, very dense. In fact, it's denser than all of President Kennedy's fellings combined. You can't see the president's dental work in these x-rays. They've been uh, removed uh, by the House Committee. But uh, Dr. Mantic studied the optical density of the dental amalgams the fillings. And this bright object is more dense than all of the fillings combined when they're seen end to end in this x-ray. That's a physical impossibility since this same object when seen on the lateral x-rays is trivial and insignificant in size. So Dr. Mantic's conclusion is that this object is also the product of light blasting, of, of alteration. This is also a copy film. It's not an authentic x-ray. 
and this is done to incriminate the accused assassin. The width of this fragment is 6.5 millimeters, which just happens to be the caliber of the ammunition reportedly used by the accused assassin. The important thing to remember about this is that Jeremy Gunn and I were so impressed by Dr. Mantic's research that we decided to ask the autopsy pathologist questions about this fragment at their depositions. All three autopsy pathologists, Dr. Humes, Dr. Boswell, and Dr. Fink, stated under oath to the review board that they do not recall seeing this bright fragment on the skull x-rays the night of the autopsy. Nor did they remove any fragment this size from the body of the president. And after all, what was the purpose of taking x-rays at the president's autopsy? The sole purpose was to find metal in the body, bullet fragments, and to allow the doctors to locate them and remove them for submission to the FBI lab for analysis. So none of the three pathologists saw this fragment when they viewed this x-ray the night of the autopsy. These statements were made under oath in 1996. And they all admitted that no fragment of this size was removed from the body. So Dr. Mantic's conclusion that this is an altered x-ray, that this is a forgery, and that this bullet fragment is the, is the uh, subject of uh, light blasting has been confirmed by sworn testimony. So here's a, a recapitulation of what I just explained. In addition, both Dr. Humes and FBI agent Frank O'Neill both testified under oath that the uh, two lateral x-rays, they were looking at the originals when they were under oath, looked very peculiar to them and displayed a degree of extreme contrast not seen when the films were examined during the autopsy itself. For example, this extremely dark void in the frontal region of the skull troubled both Dr. Humes and Agent O'Neill during their review board depositions. Neither man recalled seeing a skull x-ray that looked like that the night of the autopsy. My conclusion is that the high degree of contrast in the extant skull x-rays is an artifact of alteration. It's an artifact left by the forgers who did imperfect work. The longer the lights were left on during the copying process, the higher the degree of contrast. So the forgers didn't do a perfect job. And the high degree of contrast in the, in the surviving x-rays today is proof of imperfect alteration. It's that simple. 